Welcome to this week's edition of the EU VC Lowdown, the show that wraps up the week in European venture, discussing the news, making the headlines and more. Joining us today, we have a very full house for a chat about studio, accelerator and incubator models. So I'd like to welcome Sandra from Baltic Sandbox, Natasha from Future Work, Matt from Forward VC, Mikhail from Tar Heel Capital Pathfinder, Boris from Smop Ventures, Andreas from EU VC, and I'm your host, Kathy White, founder of CEW Communications. So you've just heard the huge roster of people that we have on the show today. I'm gonna invite each of those from Studio Accelerator and Incubator to do a really quick introduction to who they are, their model, and what sets them apart. And Sandra, I'd love it if you could just kick us off. Yeah, sure. Hi, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Sandra, general partner in Baltic Sandbox Ventures. We're a deep tech and life science uh, fund and accelerator investment startups. We, we're taking care of the founders. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Natasha, could you do an introduction, please? Good morning. I'm Natasha. I'm one of the founding partners of Future Work Ventures, and we focus on the future of work tech. Um, we're based between London, Stockholm and Berlin. Our uh, focus is to come in really, really early um, and to help with the ideation and also to help transform uh, offline businesses into future of work special areas. Awesome. Thank you. Matt. Well, th thanks for kicking it over, Kathy. Hey, guys, I'm Matt Ward with Forward VC. We invest in companies that move the world forward. So we help climate companies with what I like to call the world's most connected, ultra connected uh, accelerator. We've got 120 mentors at some of the top CVCs, VCs, corporates around the world. And we use networked growth hacking, essentially opening up our network, our, our uh, templates, our channels. We've basically become kind of the player in, uh, in climate space to help climate companies grow and scale because these companies need impact. And the only way they get impact is if they actually get into the corporates and clients. So that's basically what we do. We invest in the company and then we cheat with our partner in crime program and give them kind of what they need to get those steps forward. I'm appreciating the title of partner in crime. That's uh, that's a nice little addition there. Uh, Mikhail, finally, could you do an introduction, please? Hi, my name is Mikhail. Happy to be here. I'm from Tar Heel Capital Pathfinder. We are a Poland-based, CE-focused, both uh, venture capital and startup studios. So we invest in the early stages uh, companies as well as we open the ventures on our own, focusing on future trends and concepts that may be huge. Andreas, my partner in crime for today. Uh, you wanted to start the conversation by focusing on the founder perspective when it comes to accelerators, incubators, and every other thing that we've heard of today. Um, now, one of the things that I've heard just on the comm side, talking to founders a lot is in the grand scheme of things, because there are so many different programs and uh, options available to founders out there that often quite a lot of them can come under criticism, not necessarily providing founders with 100% of what they need. It's a bit of a mixed bag, I think, when it comes to Accelerator. I feel like the name Accelerator specifically, I know there's lots of different models in this, but the word Accelerator, I think nowadays is quite loaded. So I, I, I don't know, I'd like to start by just kind of what are founders looking for this these days? You know, there's so many options available. What do they need in 2023? I would actually say, first of all, I have no idea what, what founders are looking for in the sense that I, I am looking for, for VCs, right? I would rather say I want to kick this to Boris because Boris, you have um, both the accelerator model and VC model inside your world. Um, so I'd ask you to, to kind of tell me how do you think about the two and how they interact? And then afterwards, I think we can we can move to uh, to to, to um, Michael to to give us his perspective on that, and also Natasha. I started with acceleration programs and actually those super super early acceleration programs. So uh, programs where we accepted people who haven't really done much uh, before, first time founders, but they usually had some experience in their industries, but they really had no clue how to do a startup. They had no connections in the startup world. So I think. Acceleration programs of different sorts uh, are best suited to those people for whom this could be a kickstart to network, a kickstart to knowledge. So like the first two, three months to kind of get you into the, the startup bandwagon. You know the industry, you should have to have some knowledge about how to like what you actually want to do, how to talk to your customers, but they but it will get kind of kickstart you into the startup world. So you don't have to spend years getting to know people, but you can spend, you know, weeks or in the best acceleration programs, you know, uh, uh, instantly. You just get to introduce the best mentors in, the, in your space, people who can actually help you run a company. And then versus, you know, venture capital, usually most VCs 
would be looking for people who already have that network. So who, who already know how to talk to customers, who already have talked to a number of customers, who have the, who know how to deal with VC, who know they do want to be actually building a venture type business. And I think acceleration programs are good to get the founder the knowledge and make them decide whether venture studio model is for them, whether a VC model is for them, or maybe they should be just bootstrapping. So I think that's the that's the biggest difference. It's just stage and level of knowledge um, that you currently have uh, before you know applying to those programs. And uh, final thing, I think in the current you know situation where we are, a recession, crisis, or whatever you call it, the VCs are even more or less likely to be backing people who are uh, risky, more risky. And the less experience you have, the more risk it is for the VC to back this. So I think the acceleration model. Is gonna be even more uh, important uh, in this year and the years to come. Uh, uh, I think they've been kind of neglected all, all the while, and recently the founders had a kind of a bad reputation that they should be skipping accession programs. They actually don't get too much. I think they like the best ones. Uh, they still get you a lot. Uh, so that's my you know two cents. And now I said, let's hear it from uh, Michael. But Natasha, you were quick to raise your hand, so I'd, I'd love your take as well. Sure. I mean, you know, if we're asking what founders are looking for, I think it depends and it can break down, you know, are they looking for sector specific help? Um, are they looking for functional help or, or are they looking for team help? You know, maybe they've, they've come along on their own. Are they looking to boost that core founder team? And, and on the sector help, you know, are they looking for, to be plugged into a network of, of existing clients? And I think that goes uh, to, to the network growth hacking point that, that you were saying, Matt. And so I think it, it what they're looking for depends on what accelerator the, that would welcome them best and provide that support. So this is a big part of why we call it the Partner in Crime Accelerator. So uh, I run the Startup Tank, which is a Shark Tank or Dragon's Den for climate companies. And from that, we were getting so many applications. We were initially running a climate syndicate and we saw there were so many companies going through multiple accelerators. And we we're wondering, why are these companies going through so many accelerators? This one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then still applying for funding. And it's because they weren't getting where they needed to get to, especially on the climate side of things, there's there's so much that needs to be done in terms of traction and go to market and actual results that just weren't happening from a lot of traditional accelerators. I would say accelerators in general break down into a couple of different buckets. So there's kind of the big name accelerators where the, the, the YC, the tech stars, the 500. It's not to say they're not valuable. I think they're incredibly valuable, mostly with meeting investors. And that's kind of the reason you go to the big name ones, just like why you go to Harvard or Stanford. It's the name. It's not anything that's all that different about the curriculum. It's the name and the network. Then there's a lot of accelerators out there that I would view as almost more uh, whatever the term is, kind of taking advantage of founders. So they're not providing a whole heck of a lot. Companies are going through the program like, hmm, I wonder why I just went through that program. And I'm not going to name any names, but I think there's a lot of accelerators out there. And then there's the kind of third category of accelerators, like the, the mass challenge and the other equity free ones that partner with corporates, they get paid that way. And I find those to be very valuable as well. I find founders bouncing through those programs, doing a lot of business development, but that's basically where we came in and what we th found that founders need. So initially, founders founders kind of did an accelerator program to learn the ins and outs. Over time, the ins and outs became pretty commoditized. People know this, it's all over podcasts, it's all over the internet, it's all over everywhere. Sure, they need some help with that, but really it's more about the network, the connections and really getting traction. So that's that's what our accelerators focused on is really getting our customers or getting, well, I like to call them customers, but getting essentially our startups two to five new major customers, pilots, some serious traction. Because when you have a deep tech company or you have someone that has a climate tech solution, it takes a lot to scale up, but getting those pilots and getting those introductions into corporates, that's game changing for them. That can take them 10 steps forward. So that's kind of where we see the, the big, big value. Investors will come. The investors, um, obviously at any company that goes into an accelerator, I would say the biggest thing that companies that are entering accelerators really should be looking for is the is the sales, the network, and the the business. Because if the business is working, the investors will come, and if the business isn't working, they're screwed anyways. That's kind of that's kind of the perspective that I have and that we have at Forward VC. That's great, thank you, Michal. You got something to add here? There are different founders, and there are of course different needs and different expectations. But what venture studio or startup studio offers, uh, as opposite to accelerators or other forms, is a part partnership in building the company so the, the venture studio becomes shareholder and a co-founder let's say of the of the business so the that's not one person but the whole organization participating in building the, the company using competencies from marketing it product and so on they join for join forces with the founders to, to build the build the company that's that's what the, this model offers
Thank you. Sandra? Just my couple of cents. Uh, so talking about the accelerators and uh, basically how accelerators can help uh, founders. Uh, apart from network, which is mentioned by everyone and which is really important when it comes to network of the investors, network of the customers. Um, I don't quite agree that the curriculum is like very usual and very similar in all the accelerators. And all that the founder has to do is to sell something to the customers and then the money will follow, investors will follow and so on. I mean, not uh, since 2020, since there was, uh, like in some regions, there was pretty much shortage of the investors. And when certain investors, uh, if we're talking about, for example, seed stage, uh, it's venture funds, when they're coming to a startup, they want a little bit more than just uh, the proof of concept, just some first sales or something. Uh, they want a viable business model, they want financials and so on and so forth. And traditionally, unless the startup founder is uh, the second or third time founder, when they know how to deal with the situation already, uh, they have no idea how to do this. They have no idea how to actually work with numbers and build all those models and trying to prove all those models that they're working and so on and so forth. And um, one of the features I think of a good accelerator in this case is that they're basically helping founders explaining them how to work with numbers and give them the knowledge about this business part. Because uh, at the end of the day, if the founder is coming to this venture funds with uh, some already great customers, but completely not understanding how the numbers are going to work and here's a hard situation, this founder won't ever get funded. Agreed. Like we have an outsourced CFO that hops in and helps the companies with getting their getting their numbers and books in order because you've got to be able to talk the talk a big game, not just and back it up with the numbers, not just have the kind of here's the pie in the sky Elon Musk vision, but be unable to execute because until you're Elon Musk, you can't just make bold claims that people will believe. I want to jump in with the um, LP perspective a bit, and one of the real cons that I see for the accelerator model is that there is a tendency for it to be, you know, a bit of adverse selection uh, in the sense that the best founders can build things themselves uh, and and thus they will not need an accelerator or a uh, studio model and they they will they will not want to either they will not want or they will not need it at all i'm curious to hear your take on that because i'm sure that all of you here have been uh, been been met with that uh, <laughs> that question as well i would say the best founders don't need a venture studio in general a venture studio is you're an eir working there and then spin the spin a company out i don't see founders really ever starting a business and then jumping into a venture studio. Venture studio is the exact opposite. You start and then you go from there. They also generally don't need an incubator because incubators are relatively early. So unless it's opening up the network, I don't think you'll have the best selection necessarily in incubators, but generally people are so early, they're not actually looking for funding when they're in incubators, they're free, they're not giving up equity and they're getting some resources. So it may make sense. For accelerators, I would disagree. I would say you will definitely not have all of the same companies, but I do think you won't have so like for us, we invest and we have 1 million and 2 million post terms for the companies that come into our accelerator. And we have companies that could raise rounds at actual higher valuations or are already actively raising rounds. And the reason why they bring us on board and why they want us there is literally, again, it's the partner in crime. We invest in one to two companies. We're not doing your typical accelerator model. We've got three cohorts a year and we bring in 30 companies, which means we care like 3% about each one of them and we're indexing the market. No, we're going full in on the companies and opening up literally the entire network of here is absolutely everyone we know. Here are all of the corporates here are all of the investors here are all of the ways that we can help be helpful plus that of all of our mentors whose job isn't really to be a mentor it's much more to be a door opener for warm intros because a warm intro is worth like 100 cold outreaches so we're really trying to be more valuable than anyone else times 10 or 100 but i would say in a lot of times with accelerators it is that indexing of the market and they're indexing if they're not an incredibly valuable. So if you don't have the YC or the Techstars kind of brand name and you're not getting the best companies there, then yeah, that would be that would be applicable. You would have a, a negative bias. But if you are legitimately opening up something interesting for the founders, it can actually be a, be a positive bias. We're essentially a VC that operates with accelerator terms, not an accelerator taking in the, the lowest quality companies, if that makes sense. And that's not to say we have a VC fund. I'm not saying that for anyone who's interested in regulatory concerns, but you can read between the lines for what accelerators like to do. I would I would like to add that there are, of course, always examples of uh, founders that can do without any help, accelerator, venture studio, or VC, like MailChimp being the hugest example of the bootstrapping success. But, well, each model has, has some advantages. For example, venture studio takes 
huge part of the risk and of the operations and uh, from the founder and helps helps him grow so there 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 are top founders that uh, appreciate the the venture studio support that they they do not have to deal with many aspects of the business they the risk is lower so there there are the founders who choose this this way or or the other Putting on what Matt was saying, look, if, if you can offer something that that other people can't access or these great founders can't access, um, then, for example, network of clients, you do get good companies. But from the LP perspective, um, if you're uh, interested in being able to follow on and have a first right of refusal to follow on on an accelerator cohort, then I think that can be something interesting that, that so you'd get first access to companies that you wouldn't otherwise get. And I think maybe that goes to, to some of the adverse selection points. So those great founders, uh, basically the future unicorns, they can definitely do without the accelerator but if they have like a good accelerator as a partner they can just do it faster uh first of all it's about the network and all the introductions as uh, has already been mentioned and secondly it's uh about the mistakes that they're go inevitably going to make and if uh, their accelerator partner has experience in with working with uh, some startups already for uh some time and so on uh they can actually help them you know to prevent those mistakes to explain uh in some cases what to do what not to do because they have experience of like other startups uh doing the same stuff for like years um, and uh, it's just like a shorter way to the unicorn so to say uh when it comes to venture studio uh i mean as an accelerator and venture fund at the same time uh i'm not quite sure how can i even uh like invest as a vc uh in a company that was created or supported by the venture studio uh because for me it looks like uh, there are the founders and there is also some company that is having like a pretty much huge share uh in the startup so kind of what do i do i mean i'm not investing in founders i'm partially investing in venture studio so for me it's like as a venture fund this model is always a little bit tricky i would put it like this when i meet a uh a team that is racing for a fund on the back of the venture studio i also i always feel a bit like damn there's a lot of risk on the gp here uh because they really need to deliver on the value add to be able to to help the founders uh, uh get to the next step and i'd love to hear how you guys think about that because it must put a big pressure on you in terms of the it's not a, like a vc you just have the firm building around we need to be able to, to to invest well and we need to be able to add the in the end somewhat small value add that we have to the founders whereas when you're when you're uh, uh, building a venture studio or an accelerator model it is a real beast and you really have to come with something right um so i'd love to hear your take on that um Matt, you look like someone who want to go, so please do. When you say venture studio, you mean venture builder. Yeah, yeah. Because venture venture studio means you're building it in-house. So I would say, that I, I would take venture studio and accelerator and just separate them completely. One of them is kind of an entrepreneur program until you get to the point where you spin the company out. So obviously, if you're building the company, you've got to be good. But you've got to be good at killing ideas very quickly and finding what, what does work. So I know like... Ben Gilbert with Acquired, uh, I've spoken with him a bit about it, and they are pretty good with Pioneer Square Labs. And obviously, to be good at a venture studio model, you've got to be a good company builder. To be good at an accelerator model, I think you need to be much better at being an actual kind of investor and networker. So the reason why we built Forward VC as an accelerator is, A, I'm ADD enough to know I can't build just one company because I focus on too many things at once, but B, it also means that you can come in and open up network, open up connections, and then use the sales templates, the strategies, everything that I've essentially done with comp helping companies grow and scale faster. I can help them with all of that without being the person who actually has to do all of it. So an accelerator is more so part coach, part investor, whereas a venture studio, I mean, you're on the team and you're building the company, but you are the company until you eventually spin the company out. And the only way that venture studio models work well is if the venture studio doesn't keep very much equity once they spin the company out, because otherwise the company will be handicapped and unable to raise from VC. So generally venture studios will keep like on the order of 15 to a maximum of like 30%, probably 20% is better. And then they'll give real equity to the kind of founding team that goes to, to spin that out. That's the that's the only model I've ever seen work well for venture studios. And the nice thing about a venture studio is you don't really need much in terms of funding because you are spinning those companies out and having decent size ownership. So you're basically covering salaries and then possibly some follow on investment into the companies. But the follow on investment into the companies is more of a, a nice to have or a, a cherry on top. It's not something you have to have to make a venture studio model work. I wouldn't agree. I would say that in the venture studio slash venture builder model, you 
can agree with the founders on the split of uh, shares in the cap table that suits both parties. And it can be as as high as the regular VC VC mode. And the, the farther you go with the growth of the development of the company, the cap table becomes less less important for the for the investors. So if you reach round A or B with the proper cap table, there's more and more invest uh, regular VCs interested in in joining. So we a couple of our companies built in the venture pillar mode. The later you go, the broader the spectrum of investors that accept the the fact that the company was built in the venture builder. I think it depends with, with with the venture builder if you're continuing to add value and what value you're continuing to add, and if you're able to to demonstrate that you're um, continually providing access to a network or whatever you're doing to help. I think that can justify. Um, you know, the, the retention of equity that you're keeping in the company as it grows. I mean, why would you have to give up the equity? It's like you made the investment. You made the investment as the salary for the for the employees. You're keeping that part of the equity. You're, you're basically doing the pre-seed and the seed round. I don't see why any investors would get upset with the venture studio being there. The only time I've ever seen them be upset is when venture studios are kind of overdoing it and taking too much equity. That's why. But if you end with 20% equity when they're kind of spun out and at the, at the seed or or pre-series A stage, I don't really see a problem personally. I think Michal's point was that they take way more equity uh, than 20%. And that's what, I, that's what I've seen in uh, Eastern Europe in general. Now in Poland, you know, I've seen, you know, studios like Far Hill, but also a lot of studios in, <coughs> in Ukraine, in Belarus, in other countries, which take, you know, 50% plus of equity. Um, and the reason why they do it is they optimize the downside, not the upside, right? They, they cannot really lose. They cannot have too many startups fail. Uh, so if they're like a super, super small private equity uh, fund on super early stage, which is basically not compatible with the VC model. So that's why I'm really frustrated with those uh, uh, kind of models of the VC, because usually if there is a company uh, suddenly, amazingly, somehow that actually will be growing fast, that, you know, in spite of uh, that, 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 you know, that is fucked up in the very beginning in the cap table, it's really hard to negotiate and those companies are being put in a disadvantage compared to bootstrap companies compared to angel that you know funded companies and usually you know with good accession programs we've invested into one of the companies from Casa tornado uh, venture 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 builder in poland and you know we managed to get to a point where they actually got to back to 20 percent so and that's possible and that's one of the biggest companies now you know triendum and early birds invested and it's you know growing pretty really fast but this is they still were in a very big disadvantage when in the, in the process of kind of spinning off and trying to you know switch from the venture builder mode to the vc mode so i'll be saying really those are two different models if you have a model where you take too much equity you're just basically saying those companies will not be uh, properly uh, venture backed in the future, most likely. I mean, that's why I agree completely because, uh, for example, we're investing in the early stage and like very early stage. And uh, sometimes when we're coming with uh, some sort of a seed rounds, if 20% uh, of the company's equity is already taken 20 30% by the venture studio, we uh, just don't see a proper uh, fundraising journey for this company. And uh, we had the situation where we had to uh, negotiate uh, with the venture studio, like wants to kind of uh, help them to optimize the equity stake that they're having in for venture funds uh, in most of the cases it's nightmare i mean the team has to be very very good uh, for the venture fund to do this and to back them otherwise they just invest in other companies who for example were funded by the uh, angel investors or some other stage we see and they have like probably five ten percent of equity given away in uh, the are able to let's say uh have more money from the uh investors because if we're talking like let's say uh general uh startups and deep tech startups are two very different matters and if we're talking about the startups who are at the end of the day competing with other startups uh, through marketing budgets uh, and through acquiring as much customers as uh, they can acquire uh every every piece of equity <clears throat> i would say is crucial for them to be able to get funded and to be able to grow I don't think 20 or 30% is too much, but one thing, one thing I will say that I, it's just my experience and you guys can feel free to weigh in however you want is in general companies that spin out of venture studios have less upside and aren't kind of as interesting as VC investments. 
possibly because that's just an idea that everyone was kind of jumping in on or trying to create possibly because it's something where the founders aren't 100 percent bought in that's that's something that where i would say and maybe i'm totally wrong on this but i don't know a lot of venture studio models that have become very big despite the fact that there's lots of people doing it and there are lots of startup failures just in general but just uh just my two cents two things one is that well agree that in general VC, uh, vcs uh, do not like uh, the, st the structure when the founders have too little stake in the business so that's the venture studio taking too much is a problem I agree but but uh, on the other hand uh, in the regular vc vc mode uh, when the company jo uh, enters round b the founders have 30 percent stake in the business so then the venture studio about you venture bill or venture builder as to say you can have the, the same or or better structure and then the, the cap table is not that much of a problem as in earlier round rounds are you spinning out companies at a series b stage though generally a venture studio is spinning out like seed at the latest some sometimes earlier sometimes later i think what you're saying now is that they, those companies you know just you, you kind of accelerate them as long as they and get them some more funding from your network um, until they are kind of series B fundable, right? So you, you just skip the seed investors and pre-seed investors and you just go straight to, I wouldn't say series B investors, more like private equity growth type investors who are looking for like 2X, 3X upside. So which proves my point, those are not venture companies. Those are companies that will still make money and but it's just not, they won't make money for like typical C C B seeds. Is part of the problem there's not enough liquidity later stage for CE companies to get acquired or IPO? Just a just a thought. Lots of confused faces on this podcast right now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in. I want to ask a question coming at it more from a I guess from a, a marketing perspective, but also just like the wider ecosystem. So I've been in this world for last ten years, and in London when we had various different new accelerators popping up and we had kind of the OGs like Seedcamp and Techstars already running and one of the things that I've seen in my career just purely talking more about accelerators and incubators and I think it's starting to happen with the other other different options now is that the word became quite loaded at one point so Seedcamp I used to work for and I was there when they moved from being known as an accelerator to being an early stage fund. And there were countless reasons they made that decision. But one of the reasons was the negative connotations associated with being an accelerator at the time. Because there seemed to be a lot of promises out there for startups and for founders that were hard to navigate. These were promises made through marketing, obviously the offers of each of the various different programs that were being run. And then they weren't being met. And there was this idea, I think, for a while that being an accelerator just was sexy. There was a big rise in corporates coming along and announcing that they were going to run an accelerator program. I actually had a massive rant, which was it was meant to be a new business conversation. I was having a call with, I think it was Virgin Trains at the time, and they decided that they were going to run an accelerator program and they needed some PR to launch it. And I spent most of the call ranting at them about how they didn't have an accelerator program. And it was a weird incubator sales match up of some form but it didn't have the promises that startups should have had the reason i bring this up is for each of you and the various different ways that you work with startups you have got to provide a you know a set of benefits and you've got to market it out there into the ecosystem you know, do you find any challenges today still in what you do in sharing it with the wider ecosystem and then second to that you know how exactly are you illustrating success because it can take a while, right, before you necessarily have an exit event or one big startup has made it. So what's the, what are the other various different ways that you're measuring success that, you know, particularly for LPs that maybe don't know so much about this space as well, should be considering looking at? So there's two questions there. So sorry to confuse everyone, but anyone who wants to jump in, feel free for it. Look, I think a lot of the challenges that you're um, speaking about came, came from the volume. So uh, it was much easier to set up an accelerator and to accept a lot of companies onto it. Um, than to deliver to that volume. So uh, if you're if you're accepting ten, then you know your your attention is divided between those ten. You deliver. But actually, if you say, well, look, let, let's do a diversification model because you know X percent of them are going to fail, then uh, you want to take more on. So then you say, okay, we'll take more on, and then that'll reduce the 
that will increase the chance of having an outsized return. Uh, but then your attention is split between them all. So I think the the loaded term, as you called it, comes from the fact that everyone just thought, let's take more and more on. And at that volume, it was impossible to deliver the promises that, that people take. So at Future Work Ventures, you know, we go the other end of the scale. You know, we're working on one, two, three projects at any one time. And uh, then we are able to deliver what we say we're going to deliver. And, and to have that time and attention is, is less uh, split up. Awesome. Thank you. Matt? You know, it's basically indexing the market. I mean, Accelerator, YC's taken 100 companies or something. They're not doing anything other than making connections and indexing, but it works because they've got the brand. And I think that would be part of the negative connotation. The other the other issue as well, why a lot of accelerators become funds, well, how do you pay yourself unless you're managing a fund? And that's a, a major problem. Most accelerators, either you have to be paid by corporates who are you running it for, or you're kind of doing it as a nonprofit. That doesn't really work in the, the, the corporate model works, but it doesn't have the big upside. And, and that's what I would say as well is, yeah, you've got to be valuable. That's why kind of being the super hands on that partner in crime, that's that's what we do. You you need someone who can actually bust their butt and help you with getting traction, not somebody who can bust their butt with reviewing 10,000 applications to get 50 other companies in your cohort that are kind of taking away your time and energy. And that's, that's more or less what we do. Thanks, Matt. Sandra? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of frustration is coming from that corporate accelerator that you mentioned, uh, because when the corporation thinks about, okay, now we're going to launch the accelerator, in, uh, I would say, 80% of the cases, they have no idea why they're doing this. I mean, there is some person who is an innovation manager, and uh, a boss of this person told him or her, like, okay, now you're going to innovate, and what's uh, the easiest way to innovate? We're going to launch the accelerator. And of course, they're not meeting the needs of the founders, because uh, they basically have no idea what the startup is, uh, who the founders are, what they actually need. And at the same time, the whole uh, value of this accelerator, when those companies are promising, okay, we're going to launch the you know, pilots uh, uh, projects with our company and everything, it goes nowhere. Uh, because it's not uh, just the responsibility of the innovation manager to launch this project, it's the whole corporation that has to be involved. And uh, this is where it ends because no one is involved. And I think it's a fair share of uh, this frustration in the market that we've been to this corporate accelerator, this corporate accelerator, but it didn't work out. Yeah, I think that's the way I would summarize this from what I've seen in the market is particularly from corporates, like you were just saying, is innovation equals accelerator because it's the shiny new thing that you can bring along, but there's a hell of a lot more work to it. On that note, I'm going to wrap up for today. Thank you all very much for joining us and telling us all a bit more about what you do. I think it's been a very informative podcast and hopefully very valuable to the listeners on the other side. For you listening, make sure to check out the EUVC newsletter as well as head to our LinkedIn, where we'll continue the conversation and also post the latest funds that have raised as well as our Who's Hiring section, together with a whole lot of gifts, memes and emojis. And we'll see you next week.